but we're going to go ahead and dive right in. I'm going to try to keep the uh, biographies to a minimum so we can get into the, into the substance. So I'll just introduce people quickly. Uh, to my left is uh, Stephen Goldstein. He's been the uh, Sophia Smith Professor of Government at Smith College since 1998. His current research focuses on the relations between mainland China and Taiwan, as well as the evolution of U.S.-Taiwan relations. He has served as the director of the Taiwan Studies Workshop at Harvard University and has been a visiting faculty member at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Columbia University. And he has written, co-authored, or edited nine books, as well as many scholarly articles and book reviews, and received his PhD from Columbia University. To my immediate right is David Huang, who is an Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of European and American uh, Studies of Academica Seneca in Taiwan. His focus is on comparative politics, election studies, and the European Union. Uh, Mr. Huang served as Secretary General at the Taiwanese Political Science Association from 2000 to 2003. And from 2004 to 2005, he served as the Vice Chairman of the Mainland Affairs Council in Taiwan. And he has also served as a Deputy Representative at TECRO here in the United States. And to his right is Li Peng, the Deputy Director and Professor of Political Science at Xiamen University's Taiwan Research Institute the Deputy Director of Xiamen University's Taiwan Research Center, and an adjunct research fellow at the Research Center for Cross-Strait Relations under the Taiwan Affairs Office of the State Council. He's currently a Fulbright Visiting Fellow at the University of Maryland, College Park, and his research focuses on Taiwan politics and cross-strait relations. Uh, just before we kick off the discussion, I just would like to, uh, since it came up in our last panel, to, to note for our uh, Chinese friends studying uh, international relations that uh, Professor Mearsheimer also predicts the inevitability of a nuclear exchange between the United States and China. So they might want to think about that one. Uh, Stephen, why don't you okay. kick off? <laughs> well, I, my charge is to talk about uh, the TRA in the 21st century. And I guess I would begin uh, by saying that the 21st century ends uh, 85 years from now. So I, I think I have to scale back uh, <laughs> what I'm going to do or what I'm going to hope to do. What I thought might be a fun exercise uh, is if I tried to imagine what the uh, next anniversary uh, of the passage of the TRA would look like. That is, the, the kinds of things that we'll talk about uh, the next time we have to observe the uh, anniversary of the TRA in uh, 2019. I'm not going to predict the future. <clears throat> I can't predict the future, obviously. Uh, but what I want to do is try to raise some questions about what some of the trends will be in Asia that will touch on the application of the TRA and will certainly challenge American policy in the area. So if we look five years hence, I, th I think there are two areas where there will probably be very few challenges and very little change in the application of the TRA. One of those areas is obviously the representation area via AIT. Uh, that has developed uh, very creatively and very constructively uh, since the passage of the TRA. And the representation function has really been firmly established. And uh, that is a fact that's symbolized by the new embassy or, or the new uh, <laughs> AIT office, which is being built uh, in Taipei. It, there will be issues, probably. There will be issues of staffing. There will be issues of particularly of visits by Taiwan officials to the United States. I'm sure there'll be pressure uh, for some changes in uh, both those regards, visits to both sides. I think also the sections of the TRA regarding Taiwan's status in American law uh, will probably not change very much and that the trajectory will remain what it's been again for the past 35 years. There's a very rich, uh, if you read law journals, very boring uh, d discussions of uh, the various aspects of Taiwan's status in American courts. Obviously, the two areas where there, w where there will be challenge uh, will be in the area of se security and also in the area of congressional legislative uh, re relations. 
Now, d despite the ambiguous nature of the TRA, and despite the fact that my friend Richard Bush uh, argues that there's generally less than meets the eye uh, in the TRA, it, it has become a well-established, well-anchored uh, part of both American domestic politics and American foreign policy. It's cited uh, along with the three communiques and now recently the six assurances as uh, part of American policy. Uh, Congress, uh, there's no question, takes the TRA very seriously and they consider it to be a very well-established and firmly founded uh, uh, instrument of uh, congressional prerogative in foreign policy. So the brief answer is that the security sections will not go away. Uh, the focus will continue to be on the security sections. And then the question becomes, where will the challenges come? Or, or where, will the, um, where, where will the possible applications uh, of the TRA have to be considered? I think that uh, obviously the one that stands out uh, is the recent, depending on the term that you use, uh, the recent more assertive or more, or, or, or more uh, provocative uh, nature of Beijing's foreign policy in Asia. Uh, clearly the uh, TRA, and particularly those part, uh, that part of the TRA, which talks about the maintenance of an American presence in Asia, uh, particularly that part of the TRA, one would think, uh, will become an increasingly uh, broad er or an increasingly important area of di discussion in regard to the TRA. And that will probably touch on, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, on the question of the rebalancing and on the question of American interests. Uh, in the Western Pacific area. Secondly, I think one would expect that the development of mainland uh, military capabilities uh, will also touch on the question of arms sales. If the present trends continue, I, I think there are going to have to be increasingly more serious considerations of the uh, nature, but also the efficacy of arms sales to, to Taiwan and about the possibility of uh, American assistance in the defense of Taiwan uh, given the growing anti-access capabilities of uh, China. And this is going to bring not only uh, uh, American Taiwan security cooperation to the forefront uh, which is a neuralgic issue, obviously, as far as the mainland is concerned. But it will also, again, bring to the forefront the issue of rebalancing to Asia uh, and the place of Taiwan, which even the discussion of which uh, might also be neuralgic uh, as far as the mainland is concerned. <clears throat> Turning to uh, economic achievements, again, looking five years hence. Uh, when we talk about the TRA, and we talked about it this morning, uh, the issue of uh, how the United States uh, plays a major role in the economy of Taiwan, and how Taiwan plays a major role in the economy of the mainland. I think bilateral economic relationships, again, in the next five years will become much less important. Uh, the emphasis now, or the major issue now, is on multilateral, uh, is on the ability to, uh, of Taiwan to uh, become a part of a, not only the growing production chains in Asia, they, they're already a, a part of those, but also play a part of the multi uh, national, regional, economic forms that are being created in, 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 uh, in Asia. And of course, the question of TPP. And that will uh, touch on the United States and American policy. 
So I, I think we're going to be, and I, and I think t Taiwan is going to be thinking much more uh, <clears throat> in terms of multi, multinational, multilateral kinds of economic relations, and I think we will, we will as well. Now these are secondary questions uh, that I've just raised, I think, uh, compared to the uh, issue of the temperature in the Taiwan Straits and uh, where things might look five years from now. If you look at the uses that the TRA has been put to, it's been uh, implicitly, never explicitly, but it's been implicitly used in the 1996 uh, confrontation in the Taiwan Straits uh, to uh, try to restrain what was perceived as dangerous actions uh, by the mainland. But I think it was also implicitly used during the administration of Chen Shui-bian uh, to restrain him as well. So the TRA can re restrain uh, one side or the other. Uh, the TRA can also, if the two sides get to talking about serious issues, of course the TRA and arms sales can be used uh, to promote uh, some kind of reconciliation between the two sides. That is, I'm not talking about consultation, I'm talking about a situation where negotiations between the two sides begin to move things into a less confrontational posture. Uh, it's determined that the danger of cross-strait uh, co conflict has been reduced, the danger to Taiwan has been reduced, and the United States can play an indirect role by modulating arms sales in relation to those changes. Uh, what, what might change the status quo, though, in a more dangerous direction, rather than talking about peace, are, are the domestic politics on Taiwan. Uh, I think that uh, after a very encouraging start uh, with the early years of the Ma administration, uh, Ma's mainland policy has not resulted, as some people here in Washington feared, uh, that Taiwan would somehow inadvertently drift into the grasp uh, of Taiwan, uh, uh, of the mainland. It's actually developed uh, in somewhat of an opposite direction. Uh, that is, in the last two or three years, Ma's mainland policy has hit some very rough domestic political waters. And uh, things at the moment are uh, at a uh, juncture uh, where it is not clear to me, at least, uh, how far, how much further he'll, he'll be able to go. If you add to that, the fact that, they, that there are going to be elections in the fall, and then there are going to be elections uh, in uh, uh, 2016, uh, and the mainland will be watching those elections very closely, and that, it's, that, that I think it's very likely that at least before the elections this fall, Taiwan will be able to do nothing on the uh, services pact. Uh, it, it begins to strain, and if the DPP uh, begins to show strength, it begins to strain the patience of the mainland. Uh, it, it begins to look like uh, peaceful separation, clipping from the act. So, uh, it, it, in fact, uh, if the DPP, uh, as the campaign de develops and as the competition between the KMT and the DPP grows, the mainland's going to be faced with what's really basically a Hobson's choice. Uh, they can either back an uncertain uh, KMT that is opposed by 40% of the population, assuming they do well, or it can uh, back a DPP uh, or deal with a DPP, but the only choice there will be somehow to accept a compromise with the DPP that at the moment the mainland isn't willing to accept it. So there is no good candidate for the mainland as the Taiwan political situation unwinds in the next two years. 
So those are some of the trends uh, that, that I would look at. And then the final question becomes, what's the American response going to be? And there, I think, uh, do domestic politics are key again. Uh, we heard this morning uh, that the TRA was the result of a, a, a bi-ideological, if there's any such word, a bi-ideological and bipartisan uh, ag agreement or effort uh, in the Congress to somehow balance uh, the new and dramatic relationship with China, with the old and what was considered to be very important uh, relationship with Taiwan. And I think balance is the operative word there. It, it was to be a balancing effort. I think what's happened uh, really since, uh, since the late 1980s, clearly through the Clinton administration, has been the increasing politicization uh, of the TRA. Uh, the, the, the TRA uh, has evolved into not only uh, an expression of the prerogative of Congress in the area of foreign policy, but it's also become the rallying point uh, for anti-Chinese supporters of Taiwan from both parties. Uh, and what was intended to balance United States cross-strait policy has in the legislative branch become an instrument of those who would undermine that balance. Now, it, it, it's not fair because Randy's not here and <laughs> Randy was, was my co-author of a piece uh, on the TRA, but, but when, when he says that ta Taiwan relations are a subset of relations with the mainland, that's, that's not quite right. Uh, the, 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 two, the two relationships are interconnected and policy in one area always has to be considered in regard to policy in the other area. But I think what he expresses is a sense, perhaps, uh, of some in Washington that, that Taiwan is in a secondary position and that somehow you have to pass con congressional resolutions uh, that, that clearly are not constructive, uh, that clearly are unbalanced, and that further po polarizes the uh, question within the United States government. So what we don't need, if I'm right, and I, I rarely am, uh, <laughs> the, it, it, if the next uh, five years are gonna be difficult years with uh, serious challenges, what we don't need is a div divided government. Now this has always been, uh, you, you know, this has always been the case with the TRA, uh, but uh, the, the division between the executive and the legislature, I think is uh, fundamentally dysfunctional and it sends the wrong signals. It sends the wrong signals both to the mainland, but most of all, since we're talking about Taiwan today, it sends the wrong signals to ta Taiwan. Because, because Taiwan has a very selective vision when it looks at what's being said in Washington. And I say that as someone who met with Chen Shui Bien four times or five times in the early part of the century. They see and hear what they want to hear, or at least they did during that period. And Congress gives them a lot of things to see and hear, even more things than John Mearsheimer gives them to see and hear and worry about. <laughs> So uh, I, I would just end, uh, I, I will go back to my liberal Northeast institution and uh, leave Washington, but I, I would end with sort of a, 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 a need to uh, get the act together on Taiwan and uh, try to pursue what the TRA intended to do, uh, and that is create a balanced rather than an unbalanced uh, cross trades policy. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. That's yeah. good. David, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I would like to first express my gratitude to Dr. Bush and uh, Dr. Bonnie Glasser to invite me to participate in this very important event and share some of my idea about the TIA. I was asked specifically to talk about the, the, the implementation uh, of the TIA in the futures. Uh, let me recapitulate what uh, the panelists said in, in the morning and also uh, Ambassador uh, Ray Perhart said, just said. I think the essence of the TRA expect that the future of Taiwan will be determined by the peaceful means. 
and the TIA specified that it is a policy to consider any non-peaceful means to determine Taiwan's future a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific and uh, of great concern of the United States. And TIA also authorized the US government to provide Taiwan with arms of defense characters. And TIA established a congressional role in determining security assistance necessary to enable Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self-defense capabilities. And TIA also insists to maintain the capacity of the United States to resist any restore of the result of the force or other form of coercion endangers security or social or uh, economic system of Taiwan's people. And TIA set up the AIT uh, to carry out the daily man, uh, matters of the relationship between the people of the US and the Taiwan, uh, which according to the uh, ambassador, uh, Ray Berhar just said that he set up example for the foreign uh, country to set up the representative office in Taiwan to function that way. Um, the, for the US domestic applications, the TIA required that Taiwan continue to be treated as a US law as a state, or as if it were a state, will be a state. Uh, it further provides the continual applications of uh, treaties and international agreements to which the US and RC were parties, or the, any US law that covered the Taiwan. The TI, the law as such, does not pre prejudice against the status of Taiwan's memberships in international organizations. And finally, the TI reaffirmed that the preservation and enhancement of the human rights of all of the Taiwan's people are US uh, top objectives. The TI, as far as I know, uh, I consult some legal scholars, the TI enjoyed a unique status as a federal, statu uh, federal, federal statute. In contrast, the three communiques with China from the US views are not treaties or executive agreements hence are not equal in the status or dignities of the U.S. domestic laws. Although the three communiques and TIA together with the six assurances are core elements of the U.S. one China policies, the U.S. presence is not free to disregard the TRA, whereas he, he would be free to terminate the communiques if, the, if, if, if he see fit, even if they were binding the treaties. Now, the U.S. One China policies, uh, U.S. normalizations of the relations with China is premised on the understandings of China's commitment to the peaceful means to resolve the dispute between China and Taiwan. Based on that un understanding, the U.S. acknowledged China's sovereign positions over Taiwan but not recognized it. Because from the U.S. perspective, Taiwan's sovereign status is yet to, de uh, to, de uh, to be determined and the U.S. does not accept the PRC claim that Taiwan belongs to the PRC at this moment. Now, to China and Taiwan, U.S. policy is a process-oriented, which does not prejudice either on unifications or independence. Cross-strait disputes must be resolved peacefully by peoples across the Taiwan Strait. The U.S. opposed the unilateral change of the status quo by either side of the Taiwan Strait. Especially, U.S. opposed the unilateral change by use of force for non or non-peaceful means, which is deemed as a great threat to the peace of it in the Western Pacific by the TIA. In other words, US one China policy is open ended policies, relying on uncourse consents of the people in both China and Taiwan. Now, define the status quo in, through the, the, the PRC's constitution. Now, I want to talk about the China's anti secession law, which states that Taiwan and mainland are inalienable part of China. The status quo is such that, legally speaking, Taiwan and mainland have never been separated only that they have not yet been reunified. So any attempts defined by the Beijing to separate China and Taiwan will invoke the legitimacy of China to use the non-peaceful means against Taiwan. So China's policy toward Taiwan enshrined in the anti secession law is close-ended and inclined to use the non-peaceful means if Beijing sees it fit. So comparing China's anti secession law and the US-Taiwan Relations Act, the later one, fulfill the democratic sentiments. When the future of Taiwan is open-ended and subject to Taiwan's people's consent. Now, being a democracy, what about the Taiwan's policy toward China? Being a democracy, Taiwan's policy toward China is always try to preserve all the options open for Taiwanese people to decide when times come. When I say when times comes, we have a you know, unification guideline. The time is that when China become a genuine democracy. Now, Taiwan governments, whoever in power, does want to have a good relations with China. 
And in fact, Taiwan cannot afford not to have a good relation with China. But a good relation with China cannot come at the expense of Taiwan's uh, uh, democracy, uh, democratic way of life, which respects people's right to choose among multiple options. And even Mao's government, I think, which is against Taiwan independence, but it does specify clearly that it respects the articulations for in Taiwan independence belong to the freedom of speech. And Mao declared that the potential peace agreements between China and Taiwan will be subject to a referendum of Taiwanese people. So I think Mao's government also more or less fulfilled this kind of democratic sentiments. Here, the DPP does not differ from Mao's government too much. The DPP always insists that any change of current Taiwan status should be agreed by Taiwan's people through referendums. And unlike Ma, who proclaimed no, unification, no unifications, a DPP government probably would not have to, con would have to concede unifications if the majority of people of Taiwan agree through the referendums. Both DPP and KMT want Taiwan to be better represented in the international organizations and participate meaningfully in the international affairs. Both parties want to integrate Taiwan into regional economic structures. The difference between the KMT and DPP is how to bring Taiwan into the uh, regional integration structures. For KMT, China is the key to unlock Taiwan's e economy to regional integrations because China can block all Taiwan's attempts. For DPP, regional integrations and multiple liberalizations go first, then the bilateral agreements with China come second. Now, given this, there are already 20, 21 agreements exist between uh, Taiwan and China. Uh, it would be irrational for any DPP government or, future, or any future DPP government to scrap them. But I, I think a review and revisions of their implementations are very likely. In fact, Mao's governments also do the same things through the self and Aratus on a regular basis to, to review the uh, implementation of the cross trade agreements. Both KMT and DPP want to strengthen the national defense. But I think both suffer from the budget constraints and also public inclinations toward butters rather than guns. Transfer of defense article. I think there, there are some, in, uh, some opportunity and challenge to, uh, in, of in, implementing the TRA in, in, in the coming four, five years or 10 years. I think first, the, we have to think about transfer the defense article and service uh, prescribed in the, in the TRA. First, we need to upgrade the qualities of the defense articles. The second, the build up the credible deterrence capacities to avoid uh, John Michalmer's, uh, you know, the way to say goodbye to Taiwan. Secondly, uh, consolidation of Taiwan democracy. As I said, that the, uh, the TIs said it clearly, the preservation of the, uh, and promoting the human rights is the US objectives. So I think consolidation of Taiwan democracy is very important for, ta for the TIA to focus on in the, in the coming features, especially in support of, of Taiwan's institutional reforms to encourage more transparency, so more meaningful participations of the popular, uh, of, the, of the people. And uh, try to defend the democracy, not uh, establishment. Defend the legitimacy, not legalities. Defend a strong democracy, not, a, not thin electoral democracies. Defend the rule of law, not a rule by laws. I think that these are all, all very, very important uh, issues that maybe in the future the TIA can uh, help Taiwan to consolidate the uh, institutions. And also, I think it's very important that most of people in Taiwan, I think the great majority of the Taiwan people has an aspiration to become a meaningful participate in the international organizations and NGOs. And I we really appreciate that the US government reiterated several times that the US supported Taiwan's participation in uh, even recently the, the UN subsidiaries committees. So I think we are really grateful that US uh, make that kind of articulations and support in the public. And I think further things that need to be done uh, by uh, uh, Taiwan. And the, of course, from Beijing's perspective, is that any kind of uh, inter, uh, participation of Taiwan in the national organization must have, con have a prior consultations between Beijing and, and, and Taiwan. That probably uh, would, would be very, very difficult for a Taiwanese government to do so. Maybe it's some kind of exchange of opinion may be possible, but it's a prior consultation or, or prior agreement with Beijing to allow Taiwan to participate in the international organization, that would not be a you know, feasible option for Taiwan. Um, I think additional issues that in the coming, coming years is that assist Taiwan accession to the regional integration uh, schemes. Uh, Taiwan's government has reiterated several times that, it, that Taiwan would like to participate in TPP, 
RCEP, RCEP and FTAP, FT, uh, FTAAPs in the APEC schemes. Um, Taiwan, of course, should do it in a very transparent way. I think recent uh, student movements in Taiwan, uh, according to Ambassador Ray Burhard just said, is uh, against, more or less against uh, China. But I would say that it's more get against the black box, the intransparent way of doing the, the DPP. It's not about how to, uh, whether Taiwan would like to have a further trade liberalization. I think Taiwan, most of people in Taiwan would probably afford uh, uh, support a trade liberalization. But the real problem is how do you do it in, in the proper way? And the more transparency is very important. You know, even this is a trend where I learned it from, the, from the European uh, countries. You know, in, even in the EU, they started the two or three years of consultation of the sectors after sectors before really get on the, started the negotiation. Whereas this uh, service agreement that the students are against is against the black box, where the problem here is that the, one of the LY members, a chairman, in the committees proclaim that the, the, the law has already been passed within 30 seconds. So I think in, in this way, the government disregards the uh, democratic procedures that would really hurt the Taiwan democracies. So I think uh, com for Taiwan to, to, to have some of the uh, very good strategy to integrate Taiwan into the regional uh, economic schemes, I would say that the best way right now, under the current situations, is that to have some unilateral and multilateral liberalizations, combine these two approach, is more cost effectively. Now, signed bilateral agreements, of course, is you know, more or less for the psychological consultation. Most economists would not agree to have a, you know, more and more bilateral uh, free trade agreement because it will uh, create a uh, spaghetti balls effect that, that, that really complicate the, uh, the, the trade. Uh, Finally, I think, I think we have to consider in, in the coming futures, as Taiwan and China integrate each other on economic, social terms uh, so extensively, uh, would it be possible for China at some point to use economic coercion rather than military coercion against Taiwan? That could be the possibilities. You know, you, you can witness the, 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 the problem is that, that you know, south, south, some, some uh, southern part of the cities uh, try to uh, host uh, the uh, Uyghurs leaders, Uyghurs leaders, and and that 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 would the, the men in China immediately stop the tourists to the southern part of the cities in Taiwan. So that kind of a thing that could happen. You, know, you cannot assume that the economic integration will not have any cost of the future strategic con considerations, and that the best way for Taiwan as Mao's government trying to do is try to diversify our uh, economic uh, activities. Uh, from China to uh, elsewhere, and I think it's critically important, and also DPP government probably would do the same things. Um, for the U.S., I think it's very difficult to managing the conflicting signals of the uh, U.S. rebalance strategy. I think uh, the uh, Professor Goldstein just said that, you know, it's, oh, there, there's the difficulty in the, in the Congress and the executive branch of, of the way that they present the uh, uh, the TIA. And passing the TIA resolution may be looking good to Taiwan, but then that sends send out some uh, different signals to other uh, signal receivers, perhaps in Beijing. So that would be a very, very uh, daunting task for the U.S. to, um, to manage uh, balancing the signals. It's not that easy to have always to have a send consistent signals to, uh, to signal receivers. And, uh, I, I would say that adhering to the original spirits of the TI is the best way to do so, and because it will reassure the U.S. Uh, reassure the U.S. Uh, Asia partners. Um, finally, I think uh, uh, in response to John Sharma's uh, argument, that don't say goodbye to Taiwan. I think Taiwan would never say goodbye to the U.S. because <laughs> you have a TIA; it's your law. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. <coughs> uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to attend such a conference about uh, TRA and cross-strait relations. Um, Bonnie asked me two months ago whether I'm uh, interested in participating in such a conference. I hesitated for a while um, <laughs> because she told me I was the only scholar from mainland China. <laughs> and <laughs> even I, I was a scholar at the University of Maryland. Um, 
And he, she told me I will face lots of pressure. I told her <laughs> maybe huge pressure <laughs> at, at this meeting. Maybe and she had already predicted that I will say maybe something different and, <laughs> and with uh, some other uh, scholars. Um, so, so I've been under this pressure for almost two months. So maybe today is a good opportunity for me to relieve this pressure. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to start with uh, um, many China's position over um, TRA. So as all of us know that China opposes TRA from the very beginning. So every time when US officials uh, reiterate that uh, the, US, the United States will stick to one China policy, uh, three uh, US China communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. So the spokesperson in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China uh, will just mention the first part, okay, intentionally not to mention TRA. So uh, China regarded TRA as um, the violation of uh, US uh, China's three communiques and uh, the interference of China's internal affairs. So in the future, maybe um, we cannot see any possibility that uh, China will say yes to TRA. Also, we cannot see any possibility that the United States will revise or abolish um, TRA or um, give up the one China policy or something like that. So that's the um, basic reality we have to uh, when, when we are trying to analyze the future development of cross-strait relations and uh, US-China and Taiwan relations. So um, when talking about uh, uh, TRA, uh, US scholars uh, always mention, I, I think it's two keywords. Uh, some scholars just mentioned um, in, in the morning. Um, a lot of times the two keywords is uh, balance and uh, confidence. So let, let's um, talk about these two keywords. Yeah. And the United States has been trying to um, balance its relations with um, uh, Taiwan and uh, with the main China uh, in the last uh, 35 years, or, or even maybe even longer. So we can, maybe we can regard uh, the making of TRA itself as the balance and to the establishment of diplomatic relations with uh, United States and China. Maybe we can regard the arms sales and to Taiwan uh, as a balance to and the so-called growing and China's military threat to Taiwan and uh, maybe the enhancing and the deepening of uh, US-Taiwan relations as a uh, balance to the um, improvement of cross-strait relations, et cetera. So maybe from the United States perspective, um, TRA successfully um, maintained the peace and the stability in, the, in, in that region and protected Taiwan uh, very well from China's so-called um, potential threat, something like that. Um, but from uh, the Chinese per perspective, uh, you can see um, many remarks from uh, the scholars, Chinese scholars. And they, they believe uh, TRA only played the role of hindering China's reunification course. So because in these kinds of uh, balance, some scholars regard uh, the United States balance was a uh, kind of hard balance, hard balance. So it's time to use uh, this kind of a strategy or tactics to, to um, and maybe to um, contain uh, China's intention to influence Taiwan or something like that. It's kind of hard balance. Also, China also do some kinds of balancing uh, over Taiwan issue, but um, our strategy is maybe pay more, we pay more attention on the soft balance. We want to create some harmonious atmosphere in that region. We want to convince almost every party or in every in different groups in one party, maybe in DPP or in KMT. We just want to create such a, a harmonious environment. So, so you, you can see this kind of uh, hard balance can create uh, and some um, at atmosphere that both um, sides are not happy when uh, many China, uh, of course many China are not happy to see uh, any breakthroughs of US Taiwan relations also uh, are not happy to see the US arms sales to Taiwan uh, also Taiwan was uh, also was in nervous every time when 
um, uh, Chinese leader and the United States leader to meet together. And they are worried about whether they are going to a new statement. There are some words are not um, so good to Taiwan. So every time when the U.S. scholars say something uh, like abandoning abandon Taiwan or say goodbye to Taiwan, and some people in Taiwan are still in nervous. So everybody was in nervous. So that, that's, that's not a, a, ba a good balance. Yeah, it's, so we maybe we prefer the soft balance. Let everybody happy, not let everybody unhappy. So, <laughs> so uh, of course, the, the other keywords is um, uh, so-called confidence. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I know many um, U.S. scholars that believe that uh, uh, TRA can give the people in Taiwan the confidence to uh, while, while uh, the, uh, facing uh, men in China. Uh, maybe the logic is clear that Taiwan is a uh, weaker side, and maybe uh, China is not. Uh, mm, Mm, it should not be trusted, and uh, um, men in China intends to threaten Taiwan security or uh, trying to rule Taiwan, and some, 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 something like that. So um, many people believe that without the United States support, Taiwan will be not so confident to face men in China and cannot get what they want from uh, men in China. So. Um, uh, I, one uh, government official uh, once told me a few months ago that the United States want to just want to create a, a fair environment for the two sides to um, uh, handle this um, their disputes or handle this and uh, their problems. Um, but this logic was uh, also doubted in in China. So uh, the U.S. definition of fair uh, was regarded as unfair by China. Uh, the United States believe it's fair, but uh, some Chinese scholars say it's not fair, it's unfair. So, uh, uh, of, of course, a few weeks, weeks ago, there is a um, sunflower movement happening in Taiwan. So, some scholars regard it as, there, there's, um, that, that, that movement just, have, just shows that some people in Taiwan are not so confident enough while facing the mainland. So, so for, so from China's perspective, the United States only give uh, the Taiwanese people the confidence to say no to men, not, a, not giving them confidence to um, face the reality and to handle the problems. So the United States just told the people in Taiwan, if you don't want to talk with the men, you can, uh, you, you can have the confidence to say no, but uh, did not give them confidence to say yes. So that, that, that's, a, that's a problem. If the United States really believe um, Taiwan people can get confidence from, from them, so then they should tell the people in Taiwan, if you, you, can, you should be brave and to talk, to, talk with the man. If the man just want to threat, um, do something not um, good for you or uh, use coercion to um, threaten you, something like so the United States will stay behind you. That's, that should be the normal logic. But now the rea reality is not that like that. So the people in Taiwan are a little bit worried about talking um, with men and are worried about the, the so-called economic integration, worried about the political talks. So that, that's why uh, many scholars in uh, men in China are doubted about the so-called confidence theory. So um, on the contrary, um, the United States want to give Taiwan confidence, and the, the people in Taiwan are not so confident enough. Maybe it, my NGO authority is confident, but the, the people in Taiwan are not so confident. They do not want to give the confidence to my NGO to talk with mainland. So, but but um, Ch mainland China is more confident than before. Yeah, it's more confident than before. From the remarks of uh, Xi Jinping to Lianzhang in February and uh, and his remarks to uh, Jameson, uh, maybe just last week, we can see the confidence of men in China. And uh, this kind of confidence, I believe, um, will have some kinds of influence over the future development of cross-strait relations. I I'd like to mention four points. Uh, the the first, first point is men in China um, are confident enough to focus on the peaceful development process. So, though, though we will never give up the ultimate goal of re relocation. So, every time when um, Chinese leaders and some um, influential uh, scholars or, or, or officials mention the term of relocation, 
or mention the, the, um, the term, maybe uh, the issue cannot be delayed forever, the, the um, problem should not be um, passed for generation from generation. And some people in Taiwan or in the United States are deeply concerned about these, these kinds of remarks. Uh, they, are, they, they just worry about uh, um, whether the China will change its um, peaceful, uh, peaceful development policy or not. So my, my understanding is mentioning re reunification or mention um, the issue cannot be de de delayed forever does not mean the reunification, the, the, the reunification will be achieved in a short time or the issue should be resolved uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So that, that only means we need to sit down to create some conditions and environment to handle this problem. Just like Xi Jinping mentioned, um, uh, last week to Jameson, peaceful reunification uh, is a heavy task and it has a long way to go. So, but, but in that long way, we cannot just wait, wait and see. We have to stand up and do something. That's, that's what we want. We, we not just want to settle this problem in maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So we know that complicated, it is complicated. We know it's a very long task to, to, to achieve. So, um, and the second, or, uh, second point is um, many China and especially uh, our person Xi Jinping regard the two sides family. Uh, we, we are confident to win the heart of Taiwanese people eventually. Not maybe it's, it's still a, uh, it's a long task, it's a hard task, it's a long way to go. But we, we are confident to win the heart of the uh, Taiwanese people eventually. Uh, you, you know, Xi Jinping used the new term, Liang An Yi Jia Qing. So we, we used to use the term of Liang'an Gong Tong Ti, the Commonwealth, uh, and, uh, and also maybe before somebody used Liang'an Yi Jia Ren. Okay, but this time uh, Xi Jinping used the term of Liang'an Yi Jia Qin. He just um, want to focus on the uh, relative relations, the close relative relations across the two sides. So maybe some people in Taiwan do not admit that uh, they are, we are family, uh, do not rec mm, admit that they are Chinese. But the, the key problem is uh, whether mainland really treats the people in Taiwan as family members. So that, that's the most important thing. Uh, just, I, I'll give you an example. Every time when my daughter, when, when I forced my daughter to study Chinese, yeah, she, she was a graduate, um, first graduate student at the uh, in American in elementary school, she, she just found uh, English much easier than Chinese. So you know, every, time, every, every time I force, him, force her to write Chinese character and force her, force her to study, she, always was, she, she was mad and said, you're not my father. I don't want you to be my father. So, <laughs> so I, but I never say, you're not my daughter. <laughs> so that's so the most important thing, whether we treated the people in Taiwan as a family or as a family member or not. That's the most important thing. So we, so we, we are, so, I, so that, that's why when she, uh, Xi Jinping met Lian Zhan, um, he showed um, the deep understanding over Taiwan's special history and, uh, and the feelings, uh, special feelings of Taiwanese people. So that, that's what uh, just now Ambassador Shen said, Jiang Xin Bi Xin. So that, that's, that's very, very important. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's a new, 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 new change in, China, in many Chinese policy toward Taiwan. And third point is maybe uh, confidence gives many China encourage to correct the mistakes during the cross trade exchanges. Okay, I, I know the Taiwan issue is very complicated. Taiwan's domestic and political situation is very complicated. So in the last few years, China just issued a lot of um, policies, just want to benefit the people of Taiwan. Uh, we admitted that some, during the implement, implementation of the, these policies, there could be some mistakes or flaws. Okay, I just want to be clear, flaws or um, mistakes, and if you, if the reporter wants to translate it into Chinese, it should be shi wu or xia chi, or not, not a cuo wu or xie xie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for, for, from uh, Xi Jinping's remarks with Jameson, many China realized that um, we are 
we, we have some mistakes, we have some su or xia zi during the, la, the, the um, policy implement, implementation. We're trying to correct that. Maybe so um, in the future, maybe many China will uh, uh, hear or, or, or ready to hear the voice of the young people in Taiwan and the um, grassroots people in Taiwan, just like uh, uh, our director of TAO said, uh, when Zhang Zijun said when she, um, he paid a visit to Taiwan, he's willing to meet the uh, student and the young people in Taiwan. So that, that, that's a new, that, so the confidence gave China, mainland China, um, they, they encourage um, the courage to you know, correct these kinds of uh, mistakes. So the first point is, last, one, last point is mainland China is confident to um, face the US factor and uh, uh, maybe to discuss some issues with the United States such as arms sales issue. You know, in the past, uh, many China refused to discuss the uh, Taiwan issue with uh, the United States because we believe Taiwan issue is China's internal affairs. So the, the issue should be resolved between the um, two peoples across the Taiwan Strait. Not, there are no need to discuss with the United States. But uh, um, last year when and uh, when, when our foreign minister um, uh, Wang Yi uh, made a sp um, speech in at Brookings, he just said um, Taiwan could be the uh, access of um, you know, China-U.S. relations. Also, uh, our PLA leader just mentioned we can uh, discuss uh, arms sales issue. So that that I, I think these kinds of confidence is very important. These kinds of confidence will help. Uh, reduce the sensitivity of uh, Taiwan issue in China-U.S. relations Be because you know China always mentioned that the uh, Taiwan issue is the most important and the most sensitive issue in China-U.S. relations. So in, in conclusion, I will say uh, that uh, many China is confident enough to handling the uh, disputes with Taiwan and uh, with the United States. Um, it's time for Taiwan to be more maybe self-confident, and it maybe it's time for Ta for the United States to give Taiwan more confidence to uh, face the disputes, not to run away from these disputes. <laughs> so, I, I believe the continuous delay, delay of these disputes uh, will uh, increase the uh, exa anxieties of Taiwanese people uh, and uh, benefit uh, nobody in the last. So I stop here. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you for your candor. I think you've uh, met the pressure test well <laughs> with, uh, with humor and linguistic precision. So <laughs> that was a, a good thing. OK, well, in the interest of time, I think we're going to jump straight out to the audience. I have a question that I'd like to pa ask the panel myself, but I think we'll uh, see what the audience has to say first. Uh, per our other two panels, please do identify yourself, confine yourself to a question, and we'll take it from there. Uh, who's up first? Yeah. Hi, uh, Nadia Chao with a little bit of time again. Just one question for press, uh, Professor Lee. This morning, our representative uh, Shen mentioned uh, the process between the two, you know, two sides of Taiwan Strait is integration, neither unification nor independence. I wonder, uh, do you share this analysis? And is this you know, widely accepted in China? Thank you. Uh, maybe integration is, uh, yeah, yes, we are on the road of integration. You, you know, many Chinese scholars mentioned integration, economic integration, social integration, something like that. So also, I know some scholars in Taiwan, just like uh, Zhang Yazong, also mentioned um, so-called so integration. The tri uh, Chinese translation is Ronghe or Tonghe. So um, may maybe, but I, I don't think China say no to these kinds of concepts. So I, um, I think uh, the officials at the TAO often mention that all these are discussable. We can discuss this. So um, may, may, I, I believe maybe um, in the, I, I, I don't think um, there are some conflicts between so-called unification or integration. So that depends on how you um, interpret these terms. These terms, okay. And, and also, I, I know some people in Taiwan just prefer the uh, European model, the European, U, U, uh, EU model. So, 
I, I, I think uh, China, uh, Chinese men and are think these models are discussable, but uh, maybe it's not the final one that we will accept. So if, if, this, uh, if, the, if this kinds of integration uh, will be good for the um, peaceful development, yeah, it will help for the two, um, for two people to understand each other, for the, um, for the two sides to um, settle their disputes, in especially the political disputes, well, that will be helpful. So I, I, I think um, during the process of peaceful development, okay, integration is very important. Reunification is our ultimate goal. The gentleman over here in the corner. I'm uh, Garrett Van Der Wees, editor of Taiwan Communique. I have a question for Steve uh, Goldstein. And I actually want to go back to something that Chris Nelson said this morning. Chris, I really want to let you know that I listened to what you were saying, OK? Um, one of the things that he said is, if Taiwan was a functioning democracy in 1979, would we have broken relations? Uh, Taiwan is a democracy now. Do we still stick with a policy that was based on the situation in the 1970s? Or could you somehow envision a different policy that would take better account of the fact that Taiwan is now a democracy and uh, the r more equal role it does want to play internationally? Thank you. Well. One of the things uh, that uh, practitioners of American policy towards ta Taiwan always say, uh, or, or always talk about, is the impact of de democracy on Taiwan-American relations. And uh, w w what, what's interesting for me uh, is that uh, You'll hear a certain amount of grousing that it's a much more difficult uh, kind of relationship because of democracy. But then in the end, uh, they'll say, you know, uh, it's, it's easier to deal with a democracy because uh, you can impact uh, different parts of the population on different kinds of issues. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that policy towards Taiwan would be any different or would have been any different uh, if it were a democracy then. Uh, and I'm frankly not, the, democracy and American foreign policy are very tricky items. <laughs> de, democracy doesn't give you de facto legitimation. Not being a democracy doesn't delegitimize you as a friend to the United States. Uh, I, I still think that the, the major American interest in Taiwan is the American interest in Asia. And that's, that's it. Uh, all the other stuff helps. There are little fringe benefits, but uh, we, we cannot remain an Asian, uh, hope, hope to be influential in Asia if we walk away from Taiwan. This couldn't happen. Well, I, again, I don't think, uh, I think meaningful participation, I, I think the kind of policy that we've been pursue, pursuing uh, is, is a legitimate kind of policy. I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for me to look at Taiwan a, as an isolated little island, uh, particularly when you go abroad and go, and go to Europe. Europe has much different, uh, has much different hangouts about dealing with Taiwan. They're, they're virtual embassies, uh, te Tecro in Europe. They're treated as embassies. They're given the dignity of them. They call themselves ambassadors, some of them. And, and if you ever tried that in the United States, you know, you'd have, have to reprint your cards. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the, the, the other point that I'd make ab about um, participation, and I was hoping to provoke something about rebalancing. Uh, because I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the twice in, in American history since the Second World War that we've had a major balance towards Asia, and that was the Vietnam War and the Korean War. 
American efforts were to keep Taiwan out of it. Uh, and, and the efforts were to keep Taiwan out of it because of the fear of provo provoking the mainland. And I think that was a good policy. Uh, and, and I think that will, rem in spite of all the hopes that Taiwan might have about its role in rebalancing, my guess is that it's going to remain like that. Do you still want to interject? It, it just wait me for the microphone. Just a, a, a quick, and I've got a two finger, and thank you, Garrett. It's always nice to be taken seriously, even if you don't deserve it necessarily. Um, well, I asked, obviously, a rhetorical question about Taiwan democracy. I, I, I was asking it to focus on where it is now today as we go forward, but um, we could have had a long discussion about the, the tragedy of history, that if Taiwan had been a democracy for many years prior to 78, 79, you have to wonder what the relationship with the mainland might have been. Would the government in Taipei have still been claiming to rule all of the mainland? How could you do that if you're a democracy in Taiwan? You know, so uh, we could have a wonderful, almost Star Trek sci-fi uh, alternative history discussion here, and we didn't. But that was part of what was in my mind, that there were so many lost opportunities l leading up to 78, 79 that the, the, the authorities in Taipei had lost the, the battle really uh, by then, and, it's, and it was too bad. But that's really what I was getting at. Thanks. Okay. Question in the back corner over there. Uh, David Brown from SICE. I thought they, we had got three excellent presentations. My question is for Dr. Huang. Those of us who were not in Taiwan at the time of the Sunflower Student Movement are still trying to understand it. And I would appreciate it if you could explain what you think its implications are for future cross-strait relations. How will it impact on President Ma's ability to pursue his policies? How will it impact on the DPP, which has been considering uh, whether or not to revise its own policy? And any other implications you think it might have? Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Brown's questions. I think the uh, first, uh, the Sunflower uh, student movements come with the, uh, as a result of the uh, protest of a student against the black box, so-called the black box uh, uh, decision making of the uh, service agreements. That's uh, the original. I think the, uh, the, uh, the first casualty right now is not uh, from the KMT, it's from uh, DPP. The Premier Susan Zhao said that he won't stand against uh, to, to re-elect it as the, uh, the chairman of the DPP. I think the uh, student movement itself is uh, slow down the uh, cross trade uh, uh, interaction. I think especially a service agreement seems to be uh, now in, in grounded in, in, the, in the LY. And, and until that, uh, the, the new law that would uh, uh, monitor or control the uh, cross trade agreements enacted. So after that, then there will be a, a review of service agreements. Uh, right now, it seems that uh, the, the situation is that you need to enact the, uh, the, uh, the, the law that uh, reviewed uh, uh, cross trade agreement first and then review the service agreement itself. And I think it will slow down the, uh, the, the uh, political dialogues. I think the, uh, initially, uh, in February, the uh, uh, director of Taiwan Affairs Officer, uh, Zhang Zixun, and, 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 and MAC chief, uh, Wang Yichi, met in the mainland. China. Uh, presumably, there are a lot of uh, discussion, but the media focus on whether there will be some discussion about the uh, Ma and Xi meeting in the coming uh, September, uh, coming October, November, and uh, and there was a, a schedule that the uh, Zhang Shijun will return visit to Taiwan in April. But then, with the March 18th uh, student movements, it seems that these sort of uh, arrangement slowed down. So, uh, in the, in to, to, to think that uh, maybe uh, Zhang Shijun would not be able to come to Taiwan before June because right now there's no way for the service agreement to be passed in, in, by, by the end of June. So, uh, and then we'll come into the uh, 2014 elections that we have a midterm elections. And then with, with, with the elections in mind, that would be a very, very difficult to, uh, to have a Ma Shihui. So I think. Uh, I would say that the student movements actually slow down the cross trade uh, uh, integrations in this way. Uh, but I think the, uh, 
there, there are other things still ongoing, you know, the cross trade uh, negotiation on the uh, setting up the uh, representative office of the self and the Aratus, uh, is still continue to, uh, to discuss. And I, if I, I said that perhaps that it would be uh, recently concluded uh, because uh, China, mainland China already uh, granted the, the humanitarian visit of our, uh, Taiwan, uh, our office in, in, in Beijing. So, so they, there will be some in, uh, progress in, in this way. So if, I, if you ask me whether, uh, whether Zhang Shuxin can visit Taiwan, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> but next year is another elections. We have uh, already <laughs> yeah. the presidential elections in, in, in view. So uh, next year, Zhang Shuxin maybe come to Taiwan to open up the office of uh, Aratus. <laughs> but that would be the occasion, That only my guess. Okay, so, so, so it, it undoubtedly will slow down the, uh, the whole, whole process of cross-trade integrations. And I would say that the student movements will have a great impact on the way that we uh, review the cross-trade agreements. I think there will be a mechanism set up in the LOI, and that would be uh, uh, help Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese government uh, to be more transparent. And Xi Jinping in the James Song's meeting, with the James Song meeting said that uh, he already uh, noticed that uh, these service agreements or any cross-trade agreement must trickle down to the average Taiwanese people. So, so I think the, uh, to have a more transparent way to do the cross-trade agreement uh, or cross-trade negotiation, what would be a benefit for not only for Taiwan democracy, but also for uh, mutual benefit for the people across the Taiwan Strait. In the middle here. Uh, yes, my name is Bill Sharp, <clears throat> and I teach at Hawaii Pacific University and University of Hawaii in Manoa. Um, a a follow-up on uh, David Brown's question. So how is this going to impact the seven-in-one elections that are slated for next November? <laughs> now, Professor Goldstein talked briefly about, made a comment about the seven-in-one earlier, and you just alluded to it. So I'm really curious about that. Um, and then the other thing, I, uh, if I could, um, let me see. Well, I'll let that one go, but I'd be interested in hearing your comments on the 7-1 election. What's the outcome of that going to be, as you see it today? <laughs> I think you have to ask the fortune tellers. So. <laughs> uh, if you're looking into, into the opinion poll right now, that uh, uh, especially with regard to the uh, uh, metropolitan mayor's elections, now you, you have six metropolitan mayor elections right now. Uh, if you look into the uh, Taipei cities, the, uh, the current uh, candidate from the KMT is Lian, uh, Lian Shengwen, that's uh, Lian Zhan's son. And uh, I don't know whether the, the DPP will uh, promote its own candidate in Taipei mayor elections, but right now there will be one candidate of the, the DPP uh, and stand in compare with the, uh, with the uh, independent uh, candidates, uh, uh, Dr. Kovinger, medical doctor Kovinger, and they will compare the opinion poll. But I think the, in, in the Taipei cities, it seems to be, uh, uh, if you want to count the voters, there are a lot more voters of the support the KMT than to support DPP. Unless there's a split in the uh, blue camp, it, it seems that the uh, Lian Shengwen stand a good chance to win. But right now, even the Lian Shengwen and, uh, and the Dr. Kovinger independent candidates, uh, it's running in the neck-to-neck -neck opinion poll election, in, in the opinion poll. So uh, it's difficult to determine that the, uh, the, the, whether Taipei City will go for one, one way or the others. I think if you look into the, uh, the Taichung, I, right now, the, uh, Jason, who now is already uh, three terms, mayor, <laughs> now he's running the, the, the fourth terms, and he's, his opinion poll is really lower and uh, compared with the, uh, the challenger from the DPP. So by 20 by 20 percent of the differences, so the TPP probably would gain of the Taichung cities, and in my hometown, the Zhanghua counties, and the opinion poll is also favor the TPP. So I think they are in general that the TPP stand a good chance to win in uh, local elections, but you know local elections are always considered as a second order election, which means that the election that would not have a great impact. Or will not have the major impact in the uh, the first of all the, uh, in, in in the national regime change of national regimes, so people more or less will favor to cast a, a sincere vote uh, in, in the second order election that would vote against the, the government. So uh, seven in one elections, most of people will say that well, 
TPP probably can retain the uh, the Kaohsiung uh, and Tainan metropolitan area and then increase win the Taichung and also the uh, maybe Zhanghua. That's the central part of Taiwan. And the, the northern part of Taiwan, it all depends. You know, there are some speculations. With the Premier Su Tsang stepped down as a candidate of the DPP, uh, whether that he was stand as a candidate of the new Taipei cities. <laughs> we don't know. But new Taipei cities now currently, uh, DPP uh, is going to have uh, uh, the Yoshi Kun premier, uh, former premier to stand as uh, candidates. And Eric Chu think that uh, the current Taipei mayor, uh, Sin Taipei, uh, new Taipei mayor, uh, uh, Eric Chu probably would run for the 2016's uh, presidential elections. So if, uh, current, uh, if the current DPP candidate stand, then he will ask his uh, uh, deputy mayor to run for the new Taipei cities. And he was going to run for the 2016's uh, presidential elections. So in that case, it, it's still, the new Taipei city is still difficult to, to judge because the candidate themselves has not yet de determined. So the DPP already proclaimed that if they can win the Taichung mayor, it consider that that's a good win for, for DPP. Uh, but most of the DPP supporters probably would not agree with that <laughs> because <laughs> given that the low opinion poll of the Ma administration is that uh, DPP should win more <laughs> than just the three or out of the six uh, metropolitan uh, mayors. So uh, in, in, in this sense, I, I, I think I wouldn't, I, I, I don't know what will happen, but you, you will, probably expect a substantial gain of the DPP in these local elections. Right here, in the middle. Okay, the Ken Wang from TPAA. I have a question for Professor Lee. Uh, we're talking about democracy here, right? So 25 years ago, they have a democracy in Tiananmen. And so this is Tiananmen massacre is 25 years. So I wonder, the Xi Jinping, will we do anything to uncover the face or whatever? What do you, I wonder what your comment about this uh, Tiananmen massacre? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I'm an expert of Taiwan issue, so <laughs> I don't that's, know anything that's, about, that's off topic. Uh, yeah. about uh, no China's domestic politics. Yeah, that's uh, off so. topic. How about back here in the corner? <clears throat> You can ask your uncle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. My name is Yuda Cho. I'm a first year uh, Elliott School student here, um, currently studying Asian studies. Um, my question would be, uh, my question would go to Professor Li, because it seems like China has a lot of confidence in uh, dealing with Taiwan problems. Uh, as you've mentioned, four of the uh, Chinese confidence. One of them is uh, the, um, one of them is that uh, China has the confidence to win uh, Taiwan people's heart eventually. Um, I would like to first of all echo with Professor Huang had mentioned that Taiwan is now facing the uh, turning point, especially the institution, institutional reform, which is really important because uh, as we have known right now, the constitution of ROC doesn't really match the uh, rea uh, reality in Taiwan right now. And also uh, the student movement currently in Taiwan, one of their uh, main ask to the government is to uh, set that such kind of uh, dialogue between government and the people on this kind of constitutional reform or institutional reform issues, which uh, President Ma didn't really focus on this. Um, I, I mean, during during his talks uh, in in the in the period of student movement. So, and also Professor Wang has, uh, Huang has mentioned that uh, if DPP really won the uh, future elections, maybe presidential elections or the mayoral ele elections this year, um, they would tend to uh, decide the future of Taiwan through the referendum process, which is also not acceptable by uh, PRC regime. So, um, can Professor Lee, would you mind to extend a little bit on your confidence? Where, where did your confidence come from to win the Taiwanese people's heart eventually? Thank you. Um, th thank you for your question. I I believe um, many in China uh, are trying to um, build this kind of confidence to uh, convince the people of Taiwan to make the people of Taiwan and to get to know more about the mainland. I, I know um, since the um, two sides opened 
communications for over 20, 20 years or over 20 years, but I believe most of the ordinary people do not understand each other. They, they do not, I, I believe most of the people in Taiwan do not really know what happened in mainland China, and maybe 95% of the people in mainland don't really know what, what's happening in, in Taiwan. So that, that's, the, mm, that's the source of some misunderstandings and uh, problems. We, we received uh, mm, students from Taiwan, our institute received students from Taiwan each year. Yeah. I, always these students ask some mm, very strange questions. These questions <laughs> are very strange for, uh, for our, <laughs> uh, some of our students do not even believe that questions just come from the students of Taiwan. So they, they, they asked uh, maybe, uh, that can, can you eat some, um, maybe, do, do you have color okay in Xiamen? Some, something like that. So, <laughs> so, that, so that's why we, um, we, we believe that's a very um, big issue. So our institute trying to play the role to, um, to make the two sides to understand each other. Uh, with what we are trying to do is to Mm, make our teachers, our researchers, and our students to know China and uh, know Taiwan better than the other people. When they come to their positions in the government or in other um, places, they can tell the, uh, the other people what Taiwan really looks like. So we established three offices in Taiwan, in Taipei, in Taichung, and in Kaohsiung. We send our teachers and uh, students every month to Taiwan. We, we ask them to come, not just talk to the scholars and the officials, we ask them, we force them to talk with the ordinary people, talk with the, um, the farmers, uh, the fishermen. Uh, you, you know, some of our students and, the, and, the, and researchers can speak Minnanhua. Uh, so they, they found that the Taiwan is very different from what the television tells them. <laughs> so that, that's what we're trying to do. So, the, so I, I believe, and of course, our institute um, is um, the role is limited. But I, I believe through the frequent communication, more and more people will get to know mainland China. Maybe they do not accept uh, the political system of in mainland China. Maybe they do not understand uh, our belief or our value, our mind. But if they learn how to respect it, that's enough. We're just trying to make the people in mainland China to respect the lifestyle of, uh, of Taiwanese people, and respect the political system of the Taiwanese people, to understand why the two sides cannot come into war, the, to, not under, to understand why we should uh, keep the peace and the stability in the region. So I, I think that's, that's, that's uh, enough for two sides. So why um, Xi Jinping mentioned He Ping Fa and Ren Zhong Dao Yuan? That means we are ready to do this in the next several years, maybe several decades of years. You know, we are, maybe another um, idea is all this um, problem, all this trouble, just like uh, the sunflower movements, yes, there are problems. But uh, in our perspective, it's it's the problems of development. During China's rise, we have to face a lot of troubles, a lot of problems. Okay, maybe some people in Taiwan, some people in Hong Kong do not understand, they do not accept our policy, they do not accept what we're doing, that's all right. Maybe, in the, maybe in, uh, after 20 years, after 30 years, even 50 years, when, they, when we come back, we say what we're doing today is worthwhile, that's enough. Great. Just want a point of clarification. You're not suggesting better relations through karaoke. Just want to make sure that's clear. All right. I think we have time for uh, one more question. So does anyone, how about over here in the back? Hi. Uh, I recently graduated from Columbia University focusing on human rights. And I, I think I totally agree that uh, Professor Lee and you contributed you contribute yourself to a mutual understanding between Taiwan and China. And for, Taiwan, for the people in Taiwan, we think that's really good because it, uh, it helps uh, the mutual understanding and peace. 
But uh, because regarding, since you gave our, our the really interesting story about you and your daughter, you force your daughter to study Chinese and then your daughter say back to you that you are not her father. <laughs> then I will give you, I will give you my, uh, my story, my side. Uh, since ROC was founded earlier than PRC, then I would say ROC is uh, the older brother of PRC, then ROC can say you are not my brother. Then that's, that's acceptable, acceptable too, right? Uh, so my question would be, based on your opinion that you say China, uh, whether China treated Taiwan is the most important issue, how China treat Taiwan's, uh, the people in Taiwan is, the, the, is critical, it's more, the most critical point. Uh, but in my opinion, I think the criti critical point is when and how China dem democratize. Uh, when China democratized, that's when Taiwan, the people in Taiwan will start to think maybe unification is not bad. But until then, I don't think Taiwanese people will accept the fact that China is trying try to force Taiwan to be unified or to be part of them. So that's my yeah, personal opinion. Did you have a question? Or? Yeah, th I mean, the regarding the democratization of China, how would you think that when or how China will carry on <laughs> democratization? You have two and a half minutes to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> kidding, so, kidding, no, don't bother. Uh, okay, well, I just want to thank everyone for their participation. You've been a very patient audience, and I especially want to thank uh, both this, this panel and also my colleagues Richard Bush and Bonnie Glazer for helping us put together what I thought was a fantastic program. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks.